Um, we are delighted to have Ram Shiram here. Uh, Ram has a, an extensive resume here, um, uh, but you know, so he is currently the division chair or head of uh, software systems in uh, software and system division. Uh, uh, of the IT technology, or which technology? Laboratory. So there's a laboratory and then the division yeah. of the laboratories? Yeah. Information technology lab, mm. ITL. At um, uh, NIST. Mm. Earlier, I know, earlier I, knew, I knew that he was also heading um, a group there in manufacturing area. NIST has had a big play in uh, manufacturing and other related protocol. Um, and then uh, earlier than that, he was a, an engineering faculty at MIT. Uh, and was instrument in setting up uh, intelligent engineering uh, systems laboratory. Um, you guys have all seen the resume, uh, you know, we yeah, have seen also, I will read all of them. Uh, but he is a fellow of ASME, uh, uh, IEEE-AAAS. Um, and you guys remember we had to deal with ASME when we had the manufacturing related, we had a project from AFR for health and ontology for um, material science, right? So we are aware of from, from that perspective. So. Thank you for coming here, and his talk is on uh, healthcare. You guys, many of you have worked on health related things, so it should be uh, very, very exciting for us. Good morning, and thank you, Amit. Amit and I go back, I guess, several decades, I guess. In fact, I was influenced by one of his early papers on uh, heterogeneous databases. Uh, while I was at MIT, I was teaching courses on databases and things like that. Okay. So anyway, so today my focus of the talk is not going to be on manufacturing, but it's going to be on healthcare. And that's, I wear several hats. Manufacturing is one hat and healthcare is other hat. Because if you look at the econo global economies, manufacturing is about three point, sorry, healthcare is about $3.3 .3 trillion in the United States. That's how much you spend. And manufacturing is about $1.7 trillion. It's about $5 trillion. And manufacturing has more side effects than $1.7 trillion. So that covers almost one third of the GDP of the United States. So these are the two areas that I'm going to be focusing on. Okay, so my title of the talk today is Transformation of Healthcare Through IoT and Omics Revolutions, and you're wondering what this is all about. And I'll probably give you some ideas about what this is. Uh, there's a lot of slides which I have here to cover, but what I'm gonna do is, uh, uh, is gonna give the slides to Amit, so you can get this from him, or if you have any other questions, you can always call I nearly didn't go through, I'm not gonna talk about who we are, NIST, ITL, SSD is the division that uh, uh, I'm a part of the software and systems division. So that's, that's the one around here. That's my division. I'm not going to talk about it uh, because all you have to do is, I think, how many of you Googled me before uh, I came here? I think most of you must have done it. But when you Google, you get two Ram Sri Rams, one me and the other guy. I, the other guy is a billionaire, Ram Sri Ram. <laughs> so that's not me. It so happens that his wife and my wife also have a similar nickname, the same nickname. Which confuses us, and he also born around the same time I was born. <laughs> so it confuses people all the time, and a lot of news people always used to call me to get interviews, but alas, I can give. <laughs> say, I'll give you an interview, but that's not the same guy. If you want to hear me, but Amit said, okay, I will hear you. Don't worry. That's why I'm here. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is healthcare concept, uh, healthcare vision, my healthcare vision, and I've been talking about this for a long time, and I think Amit. Uh, if you look at his earlier work, I think when I was NIST, he had an ATP project, a very similar kind of uh, vision that they had. So this vision is influenced by a number of people uh, inputting into it. Then I will introduce something called the P7 concept, and now I like the uh, number seven, okay? There's a reason I like the number seven, because there's seven days in a week, by the way, seven gates to a heaven, okay? And there are seven hills in India, so they're all the seven is a very important number. And that's why I decided to come up with the P7 concept for healthcare. Then I'll talk about uh, this notion of the uh, smart network systems and societies, and it's also uh, internet of everything. And I think several years ago, a couple of years ago, Amit and I gave this uh, uh, IEEE Pro uh, eight minute videos on this in this particular topic. So some of these things is on the video. And, and I'm sure that all of you must have watched Amit's video at IEEE Pro. They so all you have to do is, videos. Nah, okay, now it's an incident. You all have to do is watch this video and then watch mine also. By the way, it's next to it. Okay, it's an IEEE Pro. So I'm going to discuss that. Then I'm going to talk about some technology trends and uh, information technology research issues. I'll be focusing on the IT aspects of the computer science aspects of these things. Then I'll talk about uh, health IT at NIST. Uh, for those of you, again, you probably can go through the web. There's a website here, and you can Google and find out. Uh, more about health IT at NIST, but I'm going to focus on four areas which are related to 
uh, this whole notion of IOE. Well, then I'll go to a case study. Uh, so if you look again at the National's uh, Health uh, $3.3 trillion uh, thing, where it all comes from, a lot of it, uh, if you look carefully, comes from uh, Medicare, uh, and 20% uh, comes from there, uh, something from Medicaid. About 75% comes from the uh, health insurance as such, okay? So this is the uh, this is where the $3.3 trillion comes from. Now, where, where do the $3.3 trillion go? Interesting, okay? So if you look at this carefully here, uh, only about 20% uh, of this money goes to the physicians. There are about 900,000 or so of them. And the rest of the money goes all over the place. So the hospitals, 32% and a number of things. Can, okay? So if you think the doctors are the ones who are getting a, all the $3.2 trillion, you're wrong, okay? It's going else, a lot of it is going elsewhere, I think. So actually, there's an interesting aspect of it. The thing is about, in fact, if, uh, I'm giving you a very, very uh, optimistic view of this thing. Uh, uh, if, if they use information technology, I believe that there is, they can easily get a savings of at least, at least, not optimistic, at least $100 billion in savings, okay, of this. And we don't need to worry about budget deficits and things like that in a sense, okay, because this, I, uh, all they have to do is the just efficient use of information technology, nothing else as such. If they, use, if, they, if they use it in a most efficient way, they can get like maybe half a billion dollars, I mean $500 billion or whatever it is. So there's a lot of savings that can go into this. We're going to come about three point, uh, one third, I think, so I'm sorry, 500 is too much, but uh, you can see it, about 30, 20 to 30% cost can be recovered by uh, uh, efficient use of information technology, because a lot of waste in the medical domain. Okay. Uh, some of these numbers, numbers are exaggerated a little bit, but of course, it's good to exaggerate. <laughs> Get your attention, by the way. So anyway, let me briefly talk about the levels of biological uh, information. And you can see that you can go from a very, oops, uh, uh, here at the level from societies at the DNA level. And I think some of you may be working at different levels of this abstraction, like you have the ecologies, you have the societies, individuals, organs, tissues, cells, protein and gene networks, protein-protein interaction networks, proteins, mnRNA, and finally DNA. So these are all the levels, uh, if you look at from an abstractions, from the society level onto the DNA level. And information, the computer science kind of plays a role everywhere. In my particular division, the healthcare kind of is around that particular level. And then I have this whole area of biosciences, which goes from here to here. Uh, so we all, again, health IT or bio IT or bioscience IT uh, goes from here to here. And health IT, there's some overlap at the tissue level kind of thing. And, you, and we work at all levels of abstraction. And I'll, and I'll explain that to you. Uh, and the whole, there's a whole field called omics. And how many of you heard of the whole field called omics? It's very interesting though, for those of you who are Indian, you know that there's something called OM. OM is integrative. Actually, the OM X came from there, and I, I kind of quite, kind of, or, uh, it's just a side uh, story on this. But then there's all this genomics, trans, trans cryptomics, proteomics, metabolics, and cellomics, and finally, you have the or organism around here, and many of you probably know this particular thing, <coughs> where you go uh, from the genomics to the behavior of a particular organism. <coughs> Excuse me here. So then the other thing is that, that you have to note is if you look at medicine, I'm calling it systems medicine around here, it's actually a convergence of many fields. I mean, you have the field of proteomics, you have the field of genomics, you have the bioanalysis, you have computer science, you have engineering. And you can see in each of those areas, historically, how things have progressed in proteomics where they have gel, uh, two, 2D gel electrophoresis was used to identify various proteins to you know, chip-based approaches that we are witnessing around here. Similarly, in genomics, you can see that they're gonna, uh, they've sequenced the human genome in 2001, uh, but now actually there's a thousand, for $1,000, you, you can now you know, sequence the whole genome, and then there's a 23andMe or something like that, you can send $99 and you get your genome, gen, uh, the, your, your gene profile as such. So you can see the advances around there. Similarly, there is an advances in bioanalysis, in computer science, you've seen all kinds of things happening in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of uh, uh, multi-scale simulation, and all kinds of things are happening in the computational field. And uh, the, we'll come to that uh, a little bit later on. And engineering also, there's a number of areas uh, which are like systems medicine. Systems engineering is very, very uh, upcoming area right now, and it was actually in the 1960s to 70s, 
and you can see all kinds of things happening with neuromorphic chips and things like that. Those are all basically engineering-based kind of technologies which are happening. And all of them are going to, are merging into this whole area called systems medicine, and that's the way to go. And in terms of uh, a vision for healthcare, here is what I think uh, things are leading to. Uh, and we can see there are three areas that are happening. One advances in the technology itself, healthcare technology, like you have new drugs which are being uh, uh, put into the market, you have new types of medical devices, the human genomic project you have seen. Then you have the advances in healthcare practice, the practice of medicine itself, how do you practice medicine? Then you have disease management, you have ev evidence-based care, continuum of care, and then there's, uh, if you can see there's one in the Newsweek, this thing called mind-body uh, uh, kind of activities. And, and there's a reason for that. The reason is that the human being is not really a biological system as such. There are three dimensions. The biology is one dimension, psychology is one dimension, and sociology is another dimension. What do you mean by that? Uh, there are three dimensions to human being, and that is why a lot of things that you guys are doing in social networks are important, because human being is a social being. You have to interact with, I guess you all interact with one another. Uh, there are a lot of virtual things going on around here, but still that interactions is very important, and that's why you go to a church, you go to a temple, you go to a mosque, because you interact with other people. Social, social things are very important. Uh, the biology part of it, like, suppose you know, the stress level goes up like this for you, many of you, okay? A lot of times, you know, a lot of people are under a lot of stress. And the issue, and the reason is that there's something called the HPA axis, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal gland axis. Because hypothalamus sends a message to the pituitary gland, which sends a message to the adrenal gland, which produces what is known as a corticosteroid, cortic, corticosteroid, not corticosteroids, cortisol. And cortisol actually has some uh, effects on immune system and all kinds of elevated cortisol levels. Now, if you do the following on the psychological aspect of it, if you meditate, for example, and that's what this person is doing, if you meditate, this cortisol level goes down. Okay? Even if you are in stress, and meditation is good, by the way, of course, in your classes, you can sleep too and call it meditation. <laughs> that's, thing, okay? that's what, I mean, I meditate every day and my wife claims I'm sleeping. That's yeah, yeah. Okay? So meditation is very, very important aspect of it because your cortisol level actually goes down. So that if you look at carefully, whenever you know, people are doing medicine, they have to do it in an integrative sense like this, in terms of the three dimensions that I talked about. Uh, by the way, engineered systems also have three dimensions, if anyone is interested in this. There's socio-technical uh, systems in one sense, but there's also a lot of behavioral aspects in the engineered systems. We'll come to that later on. And then there's an advances, and this is probably where many of you are involved in, advances in computing, imaging, and information technology, where you can see all this cloud computing going on, speed and storage, they are uh, uh, becoming faster and faster, cheaper and cheaper all the time, and you're seeing this networking and communication technologies along with this wireless technologies, uh, and, and then you're seeing the things called MPCDs. What are MPCDs? MPCDs actually are mobile personal computing devices. This is an MPCD. And uh, I actually use it, I don't use it much for phone, I use it for email, Facebook, Google, all kinds of things along with this device. This is part of my life right now, and you'll see and see it will be part of everyone's life. Okay? So one, then I'm, now I'm going to introduce this notion of a P7 concept. What is it? P7 concept is the following in medicine, okay? This is the way medicine is going to go. It's a concept that involves personalized medicine, like each individual will have his own uh, profile and, and, and those kinds of things. So it's predictive, like in, you can predict what is going to happen to you uh, for two years from now, one year from now, and things like that, and that, that's why it's predictive, and you can do predictive things because uh, you have machine learning techniques and you have all kinds of other statistical techniques and those kinds of things you can use to predict what is going to happen to you. Participatory because uh, you actually participate in the system, in the healthcare system. It's individualized. You are the healthcare system. A part of it, rather than the, rather than being doc, doctor centric, it's going to be patient centric, and the patient has to participate in this healthcare things. It's going to be precise because Bill, what happens is there's a lot of data coming in and things like that. A lot of situations are happening, and you're doing a lot of decision analytics on this thing. So there's a lot of AI type of reasoning going on, and a lot of analytics in the thing. So there's precise decisions you are going to make, uh, and uh, you need precision around there. Uh, so that you can clearly pinpoint what the disease is all about. Uh, then you call preventive because you want to prevent the disease before it happens, not after the fact. The medicine as it's practiced right now is people do after the fact, okay? Like you get a disease, you go to the doctor, doctor gives you some medicine, it treats the, either the symptoms or the disease. Some disease like Alzheimer's, you only treat the symptoms and not the disease because it's very hard. 
And uh, so those kind of, instead of doing that, maybe you can prevent Alzheimer's, maybe you can prevent certain things by following this path. Then it's pervasive because it has to be the point of care. Okay, it's anywhere, uh, wherever you are, it doesn't matter. It has to be at that point of care, such like suppose so today something is happening to you, and uh, you know it, the care has to be taken here, the point of uh, care. So uh, that's that's particular. And finally, it's protective because uh, in this whole uh, medical ecosystem or the healthcare ecosystem, what becomes very important uh, is the privacy and the security of your information. And people can do a lot of weird things with their information. So that's. That's what is known as the P7 concept for medicine. And so next, I'm, I'm going to talk about many of this, uh, how you achieve that P7 concept as we go through this talk. Now I'm going to talk about this thing called uh, smart network systems and societies of the internet of everything and how this, uh, uh, and uh, this again, a lot of these things, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Amit, uh, I think uh, several, uh, uh, couple of years ago at IEEE gave a talk which, is very, which has some very similar flavor as such, okay? So, so you must, you must have talked to you sometime, but anyways, maybe Actually, uh, repetitive. Projects, pardon? We have projects in each of these. Yeah, so you probably, probably repetitive, but anyway, since uh, I have the podium here. So. <laughs> 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 no, no, yeah. This broader thing is pretty valuable. Yeah. Of the, you know, the putting together in all these contexts is very important for you. You can add a proactive also, I guess. Pardon? Yeah, pro. Yeah. But seven, seven. Oh, I see. Seven, Let's start from zero. The Sunya concept. Okay. Anyway, the thing is that people always talk about this Internet of Things kind of thing. Must have heard about it all the time. It's in all the news. Everything. I won't be surprised. Even actually, if for example, if you go to India and things like that, now the Prime Minister there talks about these things, cyber physical systems, Internet of Things, and everyone talks about it now. I'll give you a talk about that. So I introduce Namo to Knowledge Society. Knowledge. Okay. So we nowadays they talk about AI, but we come to that. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, the Internet of Things essentially what happens is you have this physical world. And uh, this one is not showing very well here, but anyway, you have this physical world, and then you have all these things like the environment, physical networks, things and people, and there's this whole notion of sensing and acting going on. You have kind of things from the environment, uh, information is coming, you're sensing, and then you're kind of doing some action based on whatever you're sensing. And that's generally we call the internet of things, because everything is connected to everything over the internet, but the internet is important around here. So then what you do is that you add, you add this thing called systems and controller. So you add one more level. Now you control this whole thing. And the minute you control this thing, you becomes what are known as a cyber physical systems. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about terminology around here because there's a lot of confusion out there what these things are. So here's an example of a, in an hospital room of a CPS system where you have the patient, the HVAC systems, the thermosats, all of them are connected uh, to the <coughs> internet kind of thing. So this is a cyber physical system. Or in fact, even the Google car is some kind of a five cyber physical system that, you, that, that that's floating around. I don't know how many Google cars you have around here. This autonomous car is all about cyber physical systems. Now, what happens is that in addition to the this particular uh, uh, things connected to all over the places, is people have some role in that. You have the societies now. You have formal organizations, and then you have formal organizations again. We have sensing and acting and things like that. You have a far, very formal kinds of things around here, like you are uh, uh, a GM and other kinds of places at the Boeing, there are people in there, people working together and so on, and these things, and human beings uh, play a major role around here, and not only human beings from at various levels of abstraction, from the low level to the management level, they play a role in this thing, and I call this as a cyber-physical human system, and here's an example in the medical world, where you have seen those patients in that particular ward, and then they're connected to those doctors, officers, and nurse stations, and this kind of uh, expands a little bit more, uh, where you have uh, you know all these medical records, operating theaters, administration, and uh, in addition to that, you have these other networks called the transportation networks because people have to be moved from one hospital to another hospital and so on. So all these things are actually cyber-physical human systems because humans are playing a role in that. And that's one of the fundamental problems in many of the CPS systems. They forgot the human part of it. And this whole notion of the human computer interfaces that have to be adequately built, if not the systems fail. Then we have this emergence of this social networks, which you have seen in the last decade or more, in terms of the Facebook. In fact, one of the things that I did when I was at MIT is built a Facebook-like system uh, unfortunate thing is it's for the engineers, okay, that's fine. <laughs> if I had built it for the kids, that would have been pretty good. <laughs> so in, in the in this Facebook, like social systems also uh, have this uh, 
social sense, yeah, social sensing and acting. Similarly, like physical senses, what is social sensing? You guys figure it out and let me know, okay? Actually, a good PhD thesis on this. We'll come to that. Uh, and then, actually, there's a, there is a, and, and let me pause here for a minute, because we know physical senses, and physical senses come in many forms. Uh, and even this mo mobile computer device is constantly monitoring my, actually, my, f this one is monitoring my heart rate, uh, monitoring what I do every day, how much I sleep. It, last night, apparently, I've not slept well. <laughs> I was I was. I should have done more meditation because it was stress giving a talk here. <laughs> okay. And all these things are being monitored constantly or physiologically. We'll come to that later on anyway. But the senses are doing that. Now, what is social senses? Social senses, again, is like we're all talking together and we are all Facebooking. And so there's some patterns out there which are coming out. Okay, like for example, when you talk about the terrorists, they're all in New York and other cases, they're actually, these guys are talking in the, on the web in there. And you can take some patterns out there and you can sense those patterns, the things. So this whole notion of social senses. And then when you come the social and you combine the social senses and physical senses, we have no we know we have what are known as the socio-physical senses. Because you have to take the social senses part of it and what's happening in the environment, the physical senses. And I'll come to an example later on on that. So this whole thing is what we call it as the smart network systems and societies, where you have all the social networks connected along with the physical sensor networks, all of them together. In fact, in physical sensor networks, uh, you, uh, there, uh, uh, Amit has uh, done something called, the, I think SSN, the semantic sensor networks. How many of you have heard of that kind of thing? So this, those are the physical sensors kind of thing. And you expand, you add to that SSN kind of this social uh, sensors, you have SSSN, you add one more S in there. So S to the power of three N is, uh, is, is what we are heading to in these things. And here is an example. Now, now the example here is that the patients actually have their own social media and the doctors have their own social media. In fact, nowadays patients, I think most of you actually do this before you go to the doctor, you actually do what? Google search. <laughs> Find out what is the system. And then you go to the doctor, and then you can actually, you know, a guy like me, I tell my doctor what my symptoms are, potential diagnosis and potential medicines also. <laughs> so he didn't even ask me anything nowadays. He says, okay, now what prescription do I write for you? Okay. <laughs> Kind of things. And doctors actually have their own media, they talk to one another, and uh, they have their own uh, social media going on there, and, all, and patients also. Actually, it's kind of interesting, a lot of patients want to be on your Facebook friends for whatever reason, okay? My wife is a physician and she refuses to get any of the patients as Facebook friends. You don't combine professional and personal kind of things. Facebook can be pretty dangerous. So what makes this thing kind of happen, this is a technology trends, why is this whole ecosystem now feasible? There's lots of things which are happening uh, because the MPCDs and other variable devices, those are these this MPCDs, and there's a whole lot of variable devices here. They're all emerging. Uh, you have devices are connected through the internet, and then you have emergence of the social networks, as you all know. Then you have this, uh, I call it the cloud or cloudlets, okay, whatever you call them, the fog computing, cloud computing, and so on. There's all this cloud computing is taking over too, uh, and uh, it's, it's doing it in a very efficient manner. And there's this whole rebirth of AI. Uh, and Amit and I used to be in AI uh, in the 1980s. And 1980s AI is actually there's a total resurgence. At that time, we used to call it connection systems. Now they're called, I think, deep learning, DL, <laughs> not description logic, deep learning. So there are kinds of things which are emerging right now. The whole AI field is suddenly kind of uh, uh, blossoming, and rightly so, because what has happened is a lot of trends in there, as you know, that the computers are becoming faster and faster and things like that, and you have multi core systems. You can attach as many nodes as you want and things like that. Lots of things are happening. So it's a big emergence for artificial intelligence right now, and that's also helping in this whole thing. You need it. Then you have these advances in human-computer interactions, uh, how you kind of interface with the computer to speech, natural language, and those kinds of things. They're all changing. The whole thing about how the human, I think some of you may be in, uh, probably familiar with the virtual reality kind of systems. And actually, the two most widely used applications of computers are one, texting, uh, the word processing systems, okay, like some, some of you are probably texting, okay, or looking at the Facebook, I'm not sure, okay. So, the text message thing. And second one, the video games. Why video games? Because video games, you are involved with the, with the computer as such. So, there's the silicon carbon interfaces which are very tight in the video games. So, and that's, that's why the human computer interfaces here become very important. A lot of times, actually, what happens is doctors, uh, they use these computers, but the interface is so bad, they make mistakes because the interfaces are bad. We'll come to that again. And then this whole notion of biometrics. And uh, in fact, I don't know whether some of you have read this news in China, 
where they're detecting your faces and they kind of make all kinds of decisions based on that. So you better be careful in terms of you know how biometrics is used. And all you have to do is walk back. Maybe Amit is installing some of those things in the corridors. Better be careful. Okay? <laughs> uh, you can say, Professor, I was here yesterday. No, you were not here yesterday because none of your your face has not been detected by <laughs> biometric system, and that could potentially happen. And there's a guy named Osgan at uh, UCLA. He's got he's got all kinds of neat things uh, uh, in his. Uh, what, what happened to that? Okay. He's got he's got all kinds of neat devices, extensions of the smartphones. Whereas actually you can detect malaria, and uh, uh, nowadays actually the devices where uh, you have just a one uh, drop of blood you put into the device, and it will give you the entire profile of that in 30 seconds. And this was developed by I think the gentleman's name is Stephen Chu or something like that at uh, Princeton University, and he developed. It's a member of the academy, and he developed that uh, that particular system. So you have all kinds of things nowadays that uh, that you have, and I think Google Glasses are going to come back later on. Uh, they went out of they are in hiatus. But Google Glasses have something very important because you now the doctor is looking at the patient and recording all kinds of information as such, and it's going to be resurgence of that kind of thing. And there's a number of things which are happening uh, in these things, and, uh, and then you have uh, all kinds of applications. And uh, I'm going to talk to sometime later about this thing called the endoscope capsule. Uh, it's a small capsule where you kind of uh, uh, swallow and it comes out. So it's an input-output system. So we'll talk about it later. So there's a lot of uh, uh, information technology challenges associated uh, with this, uh, with, with the IOE or the smart network systems and societies. As you can see, privacy and security. Uh, again, I put seven, so that's why I clubbed privacy and security. Although the privacy people don't like that because they think privacy and security are two different problems. But anyway, they're kind of connected in some sense, and also the assurance part of it, the modeling and interoperability because you have to model the entire world. Uh, then there's this whole notion of co-design. Now the design happens not as because you're talking about the hardware and you're talking about the software. It's just that I'm not. It's not like I'm designing a mechanical system. I'm not an electromechanical system, but I'm designing an electromechanical system with software embedded in there. These are the embedded systems, so the co-design becomes very important. Then this whole notion of KID, which is knowledge information and data analytics. Because people are always talking about this notion of this big data kind of thing, and everyone talks about data and it. But really, actually, you should really be talking about the information and knowledge basis. Because knowledge is key. It's just not the data. It's, all, it's also that to deal with how you gather the data, what kinds of information basis you create, and what are the large knowledge bases and knowledge networks, knowledge graphs that you create. All of them become very important in this system. Then you have these network behaviors because of the physical networks that you have. Networks are, sometimes, like for example, when the tsunami hit Japan some time ago, the whole network system failed. Uh, what do you do at this time? So you have to have novel ways of connecting the networks. And one way of doing is to have these small nano robots like things floating around and connecting to the other networks. And so, so you can have it. And there's the social networks also. There's the behavior of these networks. So people are, a lot of people are doing research on these kinds of things. And there's a sensors connected in this network. There's a whole lot of network of sensors and how does how do you categorize the sensors? How do you take the abstractions out of the sensors? Your research issues. You have human-computer interaction. You can say uh, um, is, uh, the importance of that particular thing. And then you can have the architectures and uh, services. So these are, again, the seven issues that are. But I'm not going to talk about I can talk about each one of them, but I'm not going to talk about it, except that now since I've just so far introduced a couple of things, the idea of the smart networks and systems and societies are, you can call it the internet of everything, and what are the technological trends, and uh, what are the information technology and the computer science research issues associated with it, and many of you here are probably working on uh, many of those, uh, some of you are, many of you are working whatever, one to one, <laughs> many to some relationships around here on this particular aspects of, 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 of the IT research issue. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that I actually had a program on health information technology at NIST, and I'm going to talk briefly about that program with uh, uh, with emphasis on uh, some projects. Uh, now this particular program is uh, essentially started off as a uh, interoper enhancing interoperability, and uh, the idea is. Uh, uh, to accelerate the standard development and harmonization, and standards become very important in this system where everything is chaotic and, and, and heterogeneous. How do you map from one system to another system? And not only that, we are developing this conformance testing infrastructure to ensure that when people implement standards in their systems, uh, they are implemented correctly. Okay, so we have a whole range of conformance testing issues, uh, and uh, all these things will have to be 
done in a in an environment where you ensure that there is security uh, is is enforced along the system. And in addition to interoperability kind of things, we are also uh, working on uh, uh, other kinds of projects which I'll briefly talk about. So these are the kind of uh, uh, are the seven here. Emily, you want to ask a question? Yeah, maybe seven. Pardon? Mm -hmm. Could you be more precise regarding the standardization? On what? Could you be more precise uh, regarding the standardization? Standard yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll come to that. Yeah. 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 After we, this we, talk, you don't want to talk about standards. MIST is all about standards. Yeah. 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 It's, it's all, in fact, uh, about 20 years ago, I wrote a paper called Standards and Innovation, I guess, if anyone is interested, on how standards actually lead to innovation. Other people think standards do not, and a, and a simple example is music. The musical notation, once it became standards, you know, the, the hundreds of years of creative music uh, started as such. So standards used, introduced at the right time okay, will lead to innovation. And we'll talk to standards here anyway. Uh, I'll talk about standards and testing. So these are again seven projects around here that are uh, part of my health IT uh, portfolio. I'm not going to talk about all of them because that, again, uh, is all this work internal now to uh, NIS group or you yeah. still work with outside? Uh, we we kind of collaborate with a number of people on without these things. Funding. Fund? Without funding. Well, it depends. And uh, sometimes the funding goes ups and down depending on what happens in the Congress. I can't really yeah. talk too much about it because I can't make any political statements in front of the video. <laughs> no, 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 not outside again. <laughs> no, just the fact. Me, you could just answer one question. What is your role in healthcare in in uh, scientific research policy? Do you do you communicate no. with NSF? Do you communicate with NIH? And, you know, I, can you just actually? There's a whole different uh, talk in terms of we actually participate. We have what are no, we have something called an ITRD. You can Google what that is. Okay. It's an information and networking uh, R and D kind of thing, and. Uh, uh, we uh, meet, uh, all the agencies together meet regularly, like we have an health ITR day, which I'm a part of, and then we discuss what should be done, and then we are coming out with a, a document, which is a healthcare strategic framework document, which we put together. Uh, then we actually work with uh, other areas, because I'm in software also, how do you do the future of software? We do social computing. All the strategies, yes, we do, but we don't enforce any policies. We don't come up with any policies. Someone else comes up with it, but we put in, we give input into that. So, yeah. uh, so again, a, you know, I participate in a number of this, uh, uh, a number of activities going on at working groups going on in ITRD. So and we also participate in the National Academy of Medicine. I don't know whether you probably know. It's like the Academy of Engineering, Academy of Medicine. Uh, they bring out uh, uh, documents now and then reports. So I'm involved in one report which is going to come out soon on medical device interoperability. So we give input. There's one of the things that he mentioned in ITRD that he is a part of uh, is has the entity uh, very close to our heart, which is uh, open uh, knowledge networking. Uh, and uh, our own group's interests are uh, creating a vertical uh, subset of a domain subset in health, because uh, we have a very large number of healthcare-related projects mm -hmm. here. And um, uh, this afternoon at 3 o'clock, uh, both Ram and uh, Chaitanya Baru, who is NSF uh, counterpart, uh, you know, involved in that, they will be back here and we'll, we'll have some discussions and we'll tell them what we are doing about it. Uh, Win's thesis uh, and the contextualized noise graph uh, uh, could become, uh, we'll be talking to, you know, we'll, give, we'll be giving a talk on 28th of uh, March, uh, could become a potential basis for um, implementing, uh, uh, you know, prototyping technological basis for implementing this open health knowledge graph, which is for also NITRD. Well, NITRD was uh, it was behind the scenes. Of yes. that. Yeah. But it's, it's still, it's uh, it's something which is evolving right now. There are no concrete. Uh, it's not concrete. It's evolving. Let's put it that yeah. way. Yeah, and we yeah. want to create a prototype to put it out front, uh, so hope so it becomes concrete because it's not concrete now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, let me now go through this a little bit about the standards and testing since you asked the question. Now again, if you look carefully again, with the health, health uh, uh, infrastructure, healthcare infrastructure, you have a lot of participants around here. Uh, you can see their hospitals, uh, their the hospitals, the radiology administration, EHR, personal health record, we'll come to that, uh, and uh, laboratories, pharmacies, and all those things. So all, all of them are in this ecosystem. Now, one of the major problems around here is that uh, when you go to a doctor, okay, uh, the, how many 
here regularly. I actually have seen doctor in the last few months. Uh, said hello to a doctor, physical or something. Me too. <laughs> if you have done that, they normally nowadays nowadays doctors have computers in their uh, in, in in their offices, and they're actually inputting all the information to this thing called an electronic health record, and that keeps track of of, of, of it, it's a longitudinal record over time and space maybe. Okay, yeah, in they terms call it of my chart. Pardon? Yeah, they call my chart. My chart, okay. So they kind of use that thing and they input all the information. Now, one of the fundamental problems with this is that there are a lot of, EH, like for example, you have an EHR, my chart, whatever it is, and someone is using Epic somewhere and someone else is using amazing charts and so on. These EHRs don't talk to each other. There's a problem. And that's why, we need, and, and one of the things what happened is that, let me just, uh, okay, we'll come to that later on. But does it, does it, is it good, it does, isn't HL7 a part of it? That yeah, 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 HL will we'll come to that. So anyway, the problem here is that these electronic health records don't talk to one another. And not only that, you're also getting information from laboratory, from, like for example, you give your blood and they do the test and the, all the results of the test is sent to the electronic health record and it has to be absorbed by that. And also you take a radiological, uh, uh, someone takes in x-rays, those have to come incorporated in this too. Uh, there's a problem, fundamental problem with all this uh, inter interoperability. And then also, uh, like if you have flu, and the flu information has to be sent to these uh, state uh, databases, who will then send it to CDC. Uh, so there's an interface between your EHR and your the state uh, records, which will have to be so called syndromic surveillance kind of activities will have to be recorded too. So all of them will have to be recorded and sent across this network. And the problem is they don't interact with one another. It's a fundamental problem. I can tell you stories and stories out of this on the, I mean, later on, and how things are done and how things should be done kind of thing. But there is a problem. And then there is this whole notion of medical devices. Uh, my uh, cousin once was in an accident and he was taken, with ICU, he was taken into ICU. So, and what they were doing is they were monitoring his vitals all the time Except that the nurse, I mean, the vitals are all coming from this instrument. So the nurse was sitting in front of the computer and uh, she was inputting it. <laughs> so there's no interface between those devices and the electronic health record around there. Everything has to be input. And even if there is an interface, there is a problem in many of these things. And the problem has to do with semantics. Like, for example, uh, in, you know, you know, the David and Goliath, how many of you know the David and Goliath kind All of, of thing. Them okay, so, okay, so Goliath is this huge guy kind of thing, and actually he has, I think he had this problem, hypersomatotrophic gigantism. <laughs> so actually, actually what that really, this growth will be very rapid and fast and big, so the guys are very big. But the problem is that in this kind of, UMLS, this is known as a hypersomatotrophic gigantism, and in another system, it's called a pituitary gigantism. And uh, each of these systems may call semantically something else, and when they are to interoperate with one another, you have a problem in the thing, because what you mean by one particular EHR may not be the same as another EHR. And also, when you're getting information from the, uh, uh, what is that, uh, X-ray data, the, 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 the radiologist may annotate it something which the internist may not understand. Uh, as an example, my uh, sister-in-law is a rheumatologist, and uh, she has an uh, interesting issue that is, uh, it, it, some guy came and said, you know, he has his pains, arthritis pains and things like that. So she uh, gave, you know, wrote on a piece of paper something and gave it to him. And he went to the pharmacy, uh, came back one week later, and he was smiling. So she asked him, is your pain gone away? And he said, you know, my pain did not go away, but I feel very happy about the whole thing. Said, Let me see what you're taking. So because of the handwriting at that time. The, the pharmacist gave, gave him Selexa. Actually, Selexa is like a uh, Prozac type of disease for depression and things like that. So no wonder he was feeling happy instead of Celebrex. Right. Celebrex is for arthritis and Celexa. <laughs> so there's a lot of confusion around here, and that's why the e-prescription is very, is become a part of the whole thing. To what extent is this problem affected by the fact that some of the data are not computationally accessible? So somebody writes a prescription on a prescription pad, that that needs to be interpreted by something. Yeah. So that is that problem has been resolved by e-prescribing, and we we are part of that. Okay. In so general, has the problem yeah. been solved? You know, when my when my ophthalmologist writes to my internist, it's a letter. Uh, yeah. to, to what is is this is this gone or or? 
uh, uh, does the problem persist? We actually, uh, yes and no. So that's a long story. So we'll have to come back and talk to you later on because okay. we have another 20 minutes that I need to okay. wrap up. So uh, anyway, the thing is that I mean, there's a lot of things with interoperability, and there are various levels of interoperability. Uh, at the lowest level, you have all this technical interoperability, we call it, like TCP IP protocols and those kinds of things. Then you have the syntactic interoperability, and that's what uh, Amit talked about, HL7. And then over that, you have the semantic end of interoperability, because the meaning of these words will have to pass across. And then you have the organizational interoperability, because uh, people have to talk at the organizational level. Hospitals here with another hospitals. Information, suppose you are in Europe and suddenly fall sick, what happens in there? Where is your record? Where are your records? So, and uh, if you look at this electron, this is EHR centric view kind of thing I'm showing. And if you look at it, uh, you have a whole lot of uh, things uh, which are uh, interacting with electronic medical record. And there's a whole lot of standards. But basically, most of them are syntactic based standards, which are SL HL7, except these devices, which is an IEEE 11073. But everything they map that into HL7 kind of thing. And then you have other kinds of uh, things uh, that, that you have. So the number of challenges with this uh, interoperability standards, uh, because in some domains, the standards don't exist in some sense. Uh, they're all, the, the, there's so many poor, poorly de de uh, defined standards, and uh, uh, there are also too many standards in, in some situations, okay? So they compete with one another, and so on, okay? Uh, so there are a uh, number of uh, problems around here, and one other thing, one of the things that we work on is testing, because a lot of a lack of testing around there, and again, semantics is, uh, is a problem. And one of the things that used to happen is that people, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of thing, we are now in the business of electronic health record things because we found a teenage hacker who can build an EHR system pretty cheap. And that's what used to happen. Some hackers used to get together and build these EHR systems without any due respect to how the systems exchange information. So uh, these are some of the things that we are working on. Again, I can't go into too much details on this. Uh, there's a lot of work going on and I participate in a number of these standards committees at the national level. Uh, what happened about uh, 2009, we got this act called ARA, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And uh, in that act, we are, uh, uh, it calls for us to uh, ensure that the health IT standards are complex and robust. And uh, what they did was the following, there's something introduced something called meaningful use. And the reason why your physician is using this EHR now is because if the physician uses the EHR in a meaningful way, the physician gets a certain amount of money which will cover the installation of the EHR and the maintenance. Uh, my wife, as I said, is a physician, but I put an EHR in her office about 10 years ago, uh, sorry, 2008 time frame, and she never really used the EHR, they were only using it for scheduling until this meaningful use thing came into picture. Now there's money involved in there. You get 20, used to get $20,000 initially. All you have to do is st make sure that you buy an EHR which is certified, and use that EHR in a meaningful use. And they said, well, we can't do it all at once, so we do it in stages, the stage one, two, and three, and uh, at each stage, uh, you, you, some of the things will have to be satisfied. Like initially, first one was to just install the EHR and send some information across. And finally, uh, the stage three, uh, which is uh, where, where the quality and other kinds of things will be measured. So what happened is that, uh, we actually, at least my division is the division which developed the test, which developed the test uh, for this, uh, uh, so, so that we can check to see whether these electronic health records have satisfied the meaningful use criteria put out by CMS slash ONC. So that's what uh, we did. And uh, you know, there's a whole process around here. You talked about policy, how these things are generated, to actually this is where we are. We kind of, we, actually, they should have taken input from us. They did not, in some sense, in the beginning. Because of that, what happened, and now nowadays we are part of that, at that time you are not. As a result of that, they kind of put out some things which are not be testable very easily kind of thing. Okay, so they didn't have the right test procedures. So there needs to be actually a process which is not like this, but process more collaborative. Uh, so anyway, we developed a number of these things. I'm not going to get in the interest of time. I'm going to pass through this, except uh, kind of show some of the things we are doing with CDC. Uh, we do this uh, uh, syndromic surveillance reporting validation tool. Uh, we do a lot of e-prescribing kind of activities. We do, uh, and then uh, 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 point to point kind of tra transfer of information. And there's a thing called lying for laboratories, and we do the testing of all those things. So all the standards which have been developed, they're implemented in systems, and but we actually they have to pass our tests before they go anywhere. 
so that's the kind of impact we have. And then this is a stage three, and I'm not going to go through all those things except for kind of give you some information. This was about a few years old. $28 billion were given away to the doctors as, 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 as incentive. And this $28 billion, they're all dependent on a few million dollars that we get to do the <laughs> test thing. So that's the kind of things you know, impact. So, uh, and, uh, and essentially what we are doing is that we are developing this whole testing structure. So everything is automated. And this is a handful, this we can, one can talk on this slide for more than half an hour. Uh, but the summary here is, here is that we want the experts to create uh, the specifications and the standards. And you start from that uh, uh, left-hand corner, as you can see, uh, uh, you know, you, you in a particular, particular domain. In that particular domain, I want to develop these interoperability standards. The domain expert kind of gets in there, and everything else is automated until this stage. Even the test validation, all those things are automated. So we're working on this uh, grand idea, and hopefully we'll have that in a few years. And these things are being used by HL7 and other folks in developing test methods and conformance tech methods. Okay, that's so much for the, uh, most of the, that particular interoperability that is happening is syntactic interoperability. Now, the problem is that we would like to have self-integrating systems. To have self-integrating systems, uh, we need to have systems which self-describe, either the Internet of Things or devices which are there, have to describe themselves in a logical manner or in whatever way you want. That's why the semantics come into picture. And then uh, you have this exp explicit formal semantics to, to, to self-describe the systems. And now, really where we are mostly is in this common models of data. And a lot of, you know, there's a semantic web conference kind of going on next door. And they kind of talk a little bit about how to do explicit formal semantics. But we still are a long way to do this. And by the way, we made this slide 10 years ago, and still we are somewhere <laughs> around here. Uh, so uh, the approach to encoding, having the semantic interoperability is ontologies. And I think many of you know what these things are. Uh, but what I would like to bring to your attention is the spectrum in terms of in ontologies where you have at one end of the spectrum, you have simple uh, kinds of taxonomies and things like that. At the other end of the spectrum, you have modal logic, you have, uh, you have first order logic. And depending on the complexity of what you are doing and how much semantics or reasoning you need, you can go to this level. And also here you can see that I can, if I just want to do some structural interoperability, I can go and do it with an extended ER or something like that. I think actually the relational model has to go up a little bit there, which is shown right in the bottom. Uh, then you have things like UML and things like that. And what we are doing is that we are developing this thing called category theory, working on category theory, and category theory kind of encompasses from, which, from one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum. And it can do a lot more other things, like for example, in the engineering field, you have the Newtonian mechanics to explain all the mechanical systems, uh, but the logical systems are not really do a good job on the thing. So the category theory is a mechanism where it actually it kind of uh, does both the engineering kind of uh, uh, the numerical simulation and associated logical reasoning. I just want to make a comment for the guys. So, so I would call this more of a representational semantics. Yeah. And the real semantics comes when you take any of the terms in whichever model you use to how it maps to concept in the real world. Which is where the real game is. Okay. So. Uh, and then uh, there are some examples like, for example, uh, Siemens has these variables that, uh, as, as a project uh, where uh, they used a lot of this uh, uh, ontologies, like the quantities uh, ontologies. Uh, uh, for those of you who, who, who QD, which you should go search the web on that. There's, there's a semantics SSN, which uh, I mean, uh, helps start the process. Foundation model of anatomy, the symptom ontology. I mean, a, so they combined all these things, ontologies. So uh, if you want more information, you can talk to Jack Hodges at Siemens. Uh, then you have this device interoperability. Now I have to go a little bit faster here. So now we have devices, and uh, uh, we have a project on the interoperability of devices. There's a whole lot of activity going on because information is coming out of the devices, and information is going into other devices. And there are lots and lots of problems associated with it. And uh, if you are interested in knowing about this thing, uh, you kind of go to the web and uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, Google the Massachusetts uh, General Hospital, uh, Julian Goldman, and he has done a lot of work in this area. So we, we do real projects on, uh, yeah, you know, using many devices for yeah. solving specific health problems. We'll discuss it later. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about it. But I'm just giving an overview. And yeah, there's a lot of those things. And yeah, because accuracy of this data is important. Uh, sometimes one, de one, one device is saying 
uh, increase the oxygen level. The other thing is saying do something with the nitrogen level. Third one is saying that do some x-rays. So all of them are conflicting kind of information which comes in there and you got to resolve the semantics of these things. Okay. Syntax is okay. So there are a number of things that are happening there. This patient care health devices which are in the hospitals like ventilation or infusion pumps and things like that. Uh, ventilators or uh, infusion pumps and uh, they, uh, they just stay there, they don't go anywhere. Uh, and uh, there's an interoperability associated with it. And then you have this uh, wearable devices, uh, they kind of, they're not, uh, they, they can be floating around all over the place and there are a number of standards associated with it and we kind of uh, work with them uh, with a number of these uh, organizations. Uh, as you can see that uh, we do most of the conformance kind of testing and uh, we are with these are all the organizations around here that all the standards organization, HL7, ESTM, IEEE, IHE, and the number of other organizations around here we work with, like Continuum Organization, and IEC, and CINET, and, and TITREC, which is a defense organization. So we work with all of them. So I'm just gonna skip through these things, and uh, then there is this whole notion of uh, uh, wearable or Im implantable, implantable medical sensors and act actuators. Uh, there's this whole notion called the body area networks, or the BANs, so now these sensors and actuators are on you, and the problem with this whole thing is that uh, they uh, actually emit some electromagnetic radiation, which kind of interfere with other devices on your you. Because now, in, in fact, a few years down the line, and depending, you, know, you guys are all young, uh, but uh, maybe me, in a few years down the line, I might be wearing a lot of these devices, like uh, uh, one pacemaker kind of things, <laughs> or something controlling my diabetes, or whatever it is, not that I don't have diabetes, but anyway, in the future, you never know what we have. <laughs> okay. yeah. So these are the kinds of things, uh, all these devices will be uh, uh, putting out some e electromagnetic radiation, and those things may interfere with one another, and those are some of the things that we are looking at uh, to develop some standards, and uh, to do actually do a visualization of how this uh, radiation goes across, and how this radiation interferes uh, with, uh, with, with, with other systems. Now, so there's a whole lot of stuff going on in the virtual uh, thing that we have developed to understand the radio frequency propagation uh, for variable and impl implantable devices. And a lot of the work that we have done has gone into the standard, which is the IEEE uh, 802.15.6. Anyway, the slides are with, are, are with Amit, so you can uh, look at it sometime. I'm just gonna go through a little fast, uh, fast around here, uh, given that I have about 10 minutes to go. Now, other thing that's happening is that you, know, you not only have an implantable devices, you also have devices where you actually swallow. These are called the capsule endoscopy, wireless capsule endoscopy things, where you take the capsule and you kind of swallow the capsule and the capsule comes out. It's an input-output system it's acting on, except that what do you do with the capsule which comes out? Yeah. So it's a $600 capsule, okay? So, and you, can, you can't reuse it. <laughs> that's a problem. But anyway, so those are the kinds of so simulation of that, and then there's a lot of location information that needs to be but the reason is the following that I don't think any of you had colonoscopy, but uh, you know, I had mine. Uh, there's an endoscopy and colonoscopy, like a lot of people who have problems with uh, GERD and things like that have endoscopy and uh, colonoscopy you, you go from the back. Uh, but what happens is in the small intestines, neither of these things work because uh, colonoscopes don't only do the large intestine, endoscopes do the esophagus and, and the stomach area. So to do that, you have to have this, that's why you take this pill in there, which goes to the small intestine and kind of finds out what's wrong. Uh, so, uh, let me uh, briefly go with the bioimaging and bioinformatics. I think uh, this I have to go really fast, even we have a few more minutes left. Uh, and the problem again with bioimaging is that there are, if you look at the images taking the endoscopic images, there are the microarrays, there are the 2D gel uh, electrophoresis, and ultrasounds, x rays, MRIs, and all kinds of so images come in several uh, format as such. And in, major, in most of major hospitals, they have this PACS, picture archival and communication systems, and you have all this information stored in this fax. <coughs> now, one of the problems is that in, uh, in this whole field, again, for those of you working in semantics, except for the field of mammography, in most of the things, uh, there's no real semantics associated with it. And there's a huge problem in terms of radiological reports. Uh, and there's a big disconnect between the medical, biomedical image, images and, uh, and interpretation uh, because a lot of it is in the free format and the and there's a very ambiguous kinds of uh, terminologies and they hamper the data mining. And in fact, this uh, report, this was done a long, long time ago, uh, 1996, uh, by Sobel et al. Uh, when they gave this X-ray to several uh, uh, radiologists, uh, they had uh, you, this is this is actually interstitial edema and infiltrate. And there were 14 different terms were used for that. 
and 23 different terms were, terms were used for the presence of an abnormality and there were exactly 30 ways they expressed their uncertainty into the thing. Mm -hmm. And you can see the problems associated with it. That was 21 years ago. Uh, that's why we believe that there's a need for semantic standards in this imaging. Uh, so maybe you can have these standards ontologies, generated images, and I came up with this almost 10 years ago. And there's a report which came in American Radiology on, on this kinds of uh, a workshop that we, that we had. So, but our interest mostly is in the testing aspects of it. So we want to do the testing of the interoperability because there's a lot of work going on in developing the semantics and we are interested in the interoperability of these things, okay? So, and we are doing a lot of work at NIST uh, in terms of medical imaging as such because a, a medical and biomedical imaging, okay? So there are two aspects of it, you know, the medical imaging and the biomedical imaging. You've seen that there's different levels of abstraction. So we look at the cellular level and we look at the high level, which is the human level. Uh, thing. So there's a lot of things that, that, that we're doing and there's a number of these projects and I'm not going to go into all these projects because again I can give a one hour talk on, on just, just this medical imaging aspects of it. I'm going to take only a couple of them and uh, uh, talk about it. One is from images to diagnosis through ontologies. Uh, this again a project which we did about 10 years ago and this is to do with the capsule endoscopy. Uh, what happens is that when you take this capsule, it, it takes medical image, it images all the time. Now what we wanted to do is that from these images we wanted to directly diagnose what is wrong with the particular patient. So the way this works is that we, we do using some machine learning techniques, we, we gather some features and then the doctors, the, phys the doctors actually kind of told us uh, what is the feature, feature which is of region of interest and what it could potentially mean. So these are the feature vectors around here and, and then they'll say that depending on some of the problem, problematic feature <laughs> vectors and some are not and then what we do have to do is that we have to put that into appropriate ontologies. So we created this uh, GI ontology, a small prototype, and then we take the particular features that we have seen in this particular figure and uh, map uh, the previous figure is that. You can see these low level features, and these low level features, we kind of map that into uh, various uh, disease states like the Crohn disease and ulcerative colitis, which is again is an idiopathic inflammatory bowel disease. So we create these ontologies. Now here is what we're doing. We get the images, which are sign signals, and those signals, raw data, we convert the raw data into some features and those features we convert into a knowledge kind of thing where we have this map into appropriate ontologies. So you go from the raw data to the ontologies. And you can, uh, that's why the kind of ontologies are, are important around you know, this area. This is one of the examples of that. And uh, the second one is to do with the computational methodology for biomedical imaging. Now I'm going from the human uh, system level to the low level, at the, at the cellular level. And uh, this is a thing that we have developed uh, working with the biologists and the issue here is the following, like the, the biologists actually, what the, the way you do is that, if you take an example of stem cells, so you take the cells and you grow them on the petri dish and the biologists use the microscopes to actually go through this thing to take an uh, image of the thing and see how the cells are behaving, the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is computation is a very expensive issue, number one, and number two, they don't generally go through this whole process of the entire uh, scanning the whole petri dish. They only take uh, samples of these stem cells and they use those samples to uh, grow appropriate stem cells colony and then they implant into, like suppose if you have, uh, again, uh, uh, there's a lot of things where uh, idea here is to work with the biologists and the computer scientists together and we, we get the images from them. Uh, you do the segmentation, we do some machine learning techniques and then we do some ground truth analysis and I'm going to go, I'm going a little fast around here and then we can determine uh, what, it, it, uh, what is, uh, how good these particular stem cells are evolving and they give them confidence in there because one of the major things that NIST does is trust in software. So that means whatever the software that they're using, we have to have some confidence. And there's a uh, URL out there, you can go look it out, it's just, just new, news, recently released news on how this thing kind of works. So we have you know, all these things which is machine learning techniques and uh, software hardware impedance and all kinds of things, okay? So this is for the macular region. This 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 was uh, this is a recent uh, project. With, in fact, my mother uh, she had this macular degeneration problem actually holding the macula, and the problem with people who have this they lose their peripheral vision kind of thing. As you can see, uh, actually not peripheral vision. Some some people can uh, can cannot see. There some people cannot see in the bot in the in the in the front. They can see peripherally because the macula is the one everything focuses on that. And we have macular degeneration. This is what you see on the thing. Okay. You just see because this particular vision is gone, and you can see maybe you won't be able to see the side part also. 
So <coughs> what they do is that they have the stem cells which they grow on the petri dishes and you got to take the good stem cells and you implant that in the eyes of these people so that they can uh, 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 treat them. So we work with NIH on these things and I'm not going to get into details of that except that uh, based, because based on our techniques of uh, identifying the good stem cells versus the bad stem cells, they could do this transplant effectively. So that's a lesson learned, but there's all detail of how you can, how we go about doing it. And there's this whole notion of uh, bioinformatics. Again, we have a lot of projects in this area, and uh, uh, the one that uh, I'm going to talk about briefly is this computational <coughs> geometry, uh, because I come from a geometric background. And the interesting problem here is uh, to do with Alzheimer's disease. The problem with Alzheimer's disease is that a lot of people, a lot of us, at some time when you grow old, may get it, is that, uh, that there's not really treatment for that. There's only the, the symptoms, not really the disease, because they don't understand how this disease comes. <coughs> And really, what happens is that if you take the MRI of these people who die of Alzheimer's, they see a lot of plaques in, around in there. Now, why do these plaques come into picture? The plaques come into picture because this is one, one of the particular pathways that we work with, we work with uh, NIH, the National Institutes of Health, is that there is this known notion called the CDK5, cyclin-dependent kinase 5, uh, because the cell division actually, is, they're called cyclin. The, for those of you who know biology part of it, the cell divide, divides in the into the several subcells and things like that. And uh, there are several kinases which take part in there. And they're called the cycling dependent kinases because they're dependent on, on cycling. And uh, uh, this is this one particular one is cycling dependent kinase 5. It's nothing to do with cell division because the reason why it's called CDK5 is because it's very close to the CDK kind of things. And so when they're trying to give us the name, they gave it a name as CDK5. Now what happens is when this CDK5 kind of interacts with uh, uh, some of the complex, uh, P25 uh, complex uh, in, the, in the thing. So when these two things kind of interact together, uh, we have a problem. The problem is it's hyperphosphorylates under the protein, okay, the tau protein. And when it's hyper hyperphosphorylates the tau protein, uh, then what happens is that uh, uh, you get these plaques. Such. Now, there's a lot of uh, theory behind that for some of you who know this ADP, ATP, or whatever this in adenosine triphosphate. That's why phosphates are always released in there, even your memory and things like that, and the reason, that's the reason why you sleep, because adenosine triphosphate, triphosphate has to be uh, replenished in your brain, so adenosine is uh, generated over the day, so there's a lot of theory on this thing, so I don't want to get into the details, okay? Except that, let me just, so noise going on, what's that noise? Pardon? The speaker. The speaker making Oh, we realized it now, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Not on the top. Anyway, so, so the issue is that we need to find out how these things kind of work. So what we did is that, uh, and then the interesting thing is that there is in silico and, uh, and, and in vitro experiments. So the NIH where folks were doing the in vitro experiments on mice. And what they do is that they take, say, take the CDK5 protein and then they take this particular protein and see, can we actually cut this into smaller pieces and maybe that will be an inhibitor, in, can, can you inhibit it, the whole process as such? And they were doing all these experiments actually physically. So when we came in, we said, we said, well, we can do this in the computer. We can do Monte Carlo simulation and those kinds of things. And, 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 and then we can come up with an in silico experiment around here. So you do the in vitro, we'll do the in silico, and then we can compare these things. And that's what we ended up doing with them, uh, whereas we came up with this uh, uh, several uh, uh, things around here, like for example, and now the proteins, the problem with the proteins is that the proteins fold. And then there, these proteins actually, there are certain areas where they interact together. So you need to find out those active areas together. So we did the simulation of all these things and where the things potentially act. And as a result of that, what has happened is that it, initially we, we actually authenticated what they were doing is indeed fine. When the peptide that they use, like P5 or something like that, actually does the inhibition. And it not only inhibits the action of CDK5, P25, because P25 and CDK5 are naturally occurring in the brain, uh, it not only inhibits them, it doesn't inhibit the other functions of CDK5. That's the important thing part of it. And we showed all that in, in, in silico. Uh, it's a lot of computational things involved in there, but that's how it is, okay? So we have all kinds of things around here in terms of uh, uh, you know, these things uh, in the right place that they're attaching and so on. So there's a computational geometry, which is, again, my background, applied to the medical world. You know, I know I'm going a little bit fast because I want to stop in three or four minutes. <laughs> uh, so the idea is that now they're trying to, the NIH scientists are trying to build a drug based on some of these in silico experiments. So 
we, we may not. The thing is, the problem here is that we may not see this in my lifetime because this develops a long, long, this takes forever for it to get approved. So, but we know it is feasible. We know this, this is one of the pathways for Alzheimer's. There may be other pathways because everyone claims that they have a pathway around in this game. So if this pathway is indeed the pathway, then I mean, this is a potential solutions for future Alzheimer's drugs. Okay, now uh, I'm gonna take a simple example here on the case study of how all these things kind of fit together. This is developed by Ramesh Jain, which uh, you know, Amit knows him very well on these things. But I think you, you guys have very similar examples around here. I can see in some of Amit's talks. We'll see guess, this afternoon. Yeah, yeah so this, this, is, this is what uh, uh, Ramesh talks about defining a health persona and this is what is going to happen. Again, in terms of the P7 kind of medical medicine concept, uh, you'll see that all the information from logical sensors, fitness track, tracking sensors, the physiological sensors, all that information goes into this thing called the health persona. Like every day, uh, all the activities that you're doing, walking around, eating food, and all of them are recorded in this uh, person health persona every day. And then, you know, if you take the genomics information that I talked about, uh, like your G23 and me or something like that, you get your gene profile and that goes into your electronic health record. And why is it useful? Why it's useful is that there is this, there's a variant of this particular gene called CYP2C19. And if people have a variant of the gene, then if they have an art issue, then they cannot have this, uh, uh, this is the plavix is that it's a general thinner that they give to you for especially if you have uh, you know, blockage of arteries and things like that. For people who have that variation, which is uh, CYP2C19, that doesn't work. So you say, give the guy flyways, the guy's dying of a heart attack, yeah, then nothing happens. Why? Because, hey, they, you don't know that, but there is an interaction in there. That's why. But then, gene, if you look at their 30, what are 3 billion base pairs kind of things, and there are about 20,000 uh, genes in your body, but then how do you abstract it out appropriately? You don't want to put everything in there, so it's kind of confusing confusion in there, so that's it. that study needs to be done on how do you extract from the genetic information that this particular CYP, uh, this particular has this variant, variant of the CYP2C119, how do you represent them and how do you incorporate that in the electronic health record? It's not done yet, it's still to be done. So you combine this together, I think you get what is known as a PHR, which is a personal health record. So when you have this kind of a thing, and what you can do is, I'm gonna skip all this animations around here. What you can do is the following in this case. Now suppose, uh, then you can have this, I'm talking in case of an asthma. Suppose you have an, uh, in this case, for example, uh, you have all these uh, sensors getting this air quality data, and uh, there is this guy who's actually coughing. Some guys are coughing and putting that information on Facebook. And, that, and you can take these kinds of information with the location information, geolocation, and all kinds of things, because it's happening in, uh, um, uh, uh, Washington area or whatever it is, okay? But then you also have all this other information around here which we talked about health persona, the genetic information and things like that. And so from that you can easily, you know that this person, this particular person is prone to asthmatic, uh, uh, yes, and asthma is one of the problems, are prone to asthma. And then you have these rules in this, this decision making. Remember we talked about precise and things like that, the other P. So uh, we have this exam, there are some rules around here in this rule-based system uh, which based on all this data get fired and then it kind of tells the guy to get out of the place and go to the nearest hospital and things like that. Dan, this, so, is, this, this is theory, right? Pardon? This no, you guys have actually done things. So, <laughs> we, we actually did yeah, clinical trial. Implement, yeah. So you have, we actually have results on yeah, this. Yeah, so that's, that's what I'm saying, <laughs> that you've probably seen this thing before. Uh, but this example, and I've been using this for quite some time, so I thought since I'm yeah, here... Yeah, this right asthma is a very good example. I mean, as, as so as diabetes, as asthma, heart attack, you know, these are some of the things this that we one can is take. Because it's multifactorial, so there are a lot of uh, things that can go on. There's a lot of need for personalization, that's why. Yeah. So anyway, to summarize that, I know, I know the thing is that there's a lot of very... Uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm here, because to learn more about what you guys are doing. And uh, you know, you give me a good opportunity, a reason for coming here. <laughs> No, no, we'll conference out there, I don't know about the conference, but this is more important. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in terms of uh, everything is becoming smart nowadays. Nowadays, smart healthcare, smart devices, smart networks. And if you go to the grocery store, you can get smart water too. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so it's all smart. Uh, and, uh, you know, the 21st century dark, if someone kind of faints somewhere, everything is, you know, the robot comes, you know, treats you, you know, whatever I said before, all of them comes into this thing and the patient is treated. And uh, uh, so I, I don't know how many of you have heard of this thing called the fourth paradigm. 
I think Amit must have heard of it because of Jim Gray who at Microsoft was a database guy. Uh, when he died, uh, there was a, uh, a symposium. He was lost to see, actually. There was a symposium, and uh, they introduced this uh, book called The Fourth Paradigm. And you know, there's something called the Fifth Paradigm. There's a fourth one. You have to have a fifth paradigm. And when you talk about, about the web and the distributed computation, you have the web and distributed innovation. Uh, this is published by this thing, the data science. And you have the sixth paradigm. Uh, which is uh, knowledge and visualization, as you're seeing knowledge networks and knowledge graphs and those kinds of things, published by Singularity Press. And finally, you have the seventh paradigm, which is what I talked about, uh, which are the smart network systems and societies. Uh, by the way, all these three books are fake books, by the way. So I think that's, that's why seven again. Seven is important. So essentially, here it harnesses uh, census and information sources and collective knowledge of the intelligence and society. Uh, now you can do the following. You can now imagine it took about 30,000 people to build the Taj Mahal. And I believe most of them have been paid kind of thing. You know? uh, but it took about 100,000 people to build the pyramid. Here, I don't know how many of them got paid. <laughs> a lot of slave labor out there. Uh, and then it took about uh, 300 to 400,000 people to put a uh, man on the moon. Okay? Now you can imagine you know, how many, uh, what, can be, what the combined intelligence of these millions and millions of people around the internet or the billions of people on the internet can accomplish. So we don't even know what's going to happen in the future. Okay, you can only imagine at this stage. Okay, anyway, this is a talk I gave at NIH some time ago, so that's it. Again, thanks a lot. I know I went a little bit fast towards the end. But I'm just okay. So, what did you learn? Seven. <laughs> so you learn two things. One is seven, and you say, and, and the second thing that learned is, Bob, you've already been doing all these things in your know, lab anyway. <laughs> As you know, that Amit has been active in, in these things for forever. Yes. So what we are really um, happy is that we are actually doing it with a patient trial right now. Yeah. So no longer uh, things will show you something very exciting there. The other thing we'll show you is um, because you are interested in interoperability, but I'm particularly interested in, uh, we, we are trying to uh, develop this open health knowledge graph mm -hmm. and how, and that's why Chetan yeah. also wanted to share that with me. So we'll share it with you uh, in there. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of things that are relevant to here, we'll see. But it's, uh, they, they have a perspective now, a different perspective. Yeah? Standards, I just uh, trying to give you a, the overall vision, and some of the ingredients of this vision, and some of the things that we are doing around here, and you guys probably are doing similar things around there. Uh, but from my divisions, are, from this perspective, a lot of times we concentrate on representation and how do you test that representation. We don't so much work on the algorithm. The only place that we really worked on algorithms is the Alzheimer's disease, but most of the places we just don't deal with algorithms per se. Uh, we look at representations and, and, and we do actually, I, I should, should take back a little bit. We do a little bit on algorithms because what happens is uh, my division is software and systems. So in software, we, there are two aspects of software. One is we develop software for metrology and metrology of software. Okay, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. So metrology of software is you got to measure software. You want to know how good the software is. So we develop tools and techniques for measuring software. And software for metrology is that we do a lot of, there's a lot of measurements like the cells, counting the cells in the petri dish and those kinds of things. Those are the metrological issues. So we develop software for metrology. So software for metrology and metrology for software. <laughs> so these are the things, that's the software part of my division. Then there's a systems part of the division. The systems is that you have all this, you know, n number of systems interacting with each other. What is required for the systems to work? And that's why interoperability comes into picture and standards come into picture so that the systems can talk to one another. So that's my division is software and systems. It's a five second elevator speech on who we are. <laughs>